Good morning. Welcome to our weekly Forex trading strategy session. Hoo-ha! Uh-oh, we got to take care of uh, Boyke. I've been working with FX Street for, uh, what, 10 years? I've been trading currencies publicly since 2004, which is almost 12 years, I guess, right? Cool. So today, we got some news on the calendar. I think we should prep for that and go through it and maybe, well, how about trade it? I think we could do some swing trades. We could talk about the fundies, about maybe FOMC that occurred on on Wednesday. Uh, swing trades, did I say that? So on and so forth. And then how about, we'll talk about whatever you want. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Right? How does that sound, guys? You're the boss. I'm the humble currency coach. Now, we have uh, 75 minutes for this event because I want to make enough time for Q&A every single day. So I'm, I'm hoping for interaction or participation. Is that too much to ask for? Cool. Sounds good, right? Awesome. Uh, how many people trade or are interested in um, intermarket analysis? Energies, metals, indices, binaries. You want to cover some of that? Do a little gold, little oil, so on and so forth. Yeah? Me likey? What does this mean? 49 people have no idea? They don't want it? Or what? Thank you, YJ. Wow. All right. I guess I'll do whatever I want to do then. <laughs> right? I'll do whatever I want. Fine. Good enough for me. Uh, still two trades open from Wednesday. One of them is just, it was over 400 pips. It was like 450. Now it's only 388. And the other one's 82. And I closed one for 333. Yay. Very good. Good me. Yay. Good for me. Uh, so let's just start with this. What is this? Uh, Aussie dog, huh? Little Aussie dog trade. Now, this one, obviously, this is a four-hour chart. Generally speaking, the trend seems downish. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of my pips for you. Um, so that's not that crazy. Um, and you can see the zigzag going on here, which sometimes just makes it easy to see the forest from the trees. Okay, so we got that going on, but we're we're down in here, right? Notice how we make a low, lower high, but not much of a lower low, and then not much of a higher high. So I would console that consolidation, right? Or as they say in France, consolidation. Okay, because this was supposed to make a lower low like down here, right? This is what we were expecting if you traded off the top. So immediately once you see that we did make a lower low technically, right, you mark that as support. You mark this as resistance, and we got ourselves a range. Okay, this is the craziness of the uh, 
of the FOMC decision. And there's the retracement right back to where we were. And we're none the wiser. It's like it didn't even happen. Didn't even happen. What was that all about, huh? Well, the good thing is that we were we were talking about that in here. Okay, and that's where the this thousand pips came from. Uh, we had this all planned out, not not on the Aussie dollar, but it was definitely tradable because again, you know, all we're doing is looking at this area here as being resistance, right? I think more was going on there. Um, maybe just not on that particular chart. I think there was a pivot and stuff going on. Uh, monthly, monthly, uh, well, where was it? One of these charts has it. Oh, there it is. Let me back out. Do, 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 do. Okay, beauty, right? Beauty on the beast. Um, monthly pivot, monthly pivot, weekly pivot, weekly pivot. Right, <laughs> right. Pivot. Oops. Oop. Can't even draw the arrow properly. Pivot. Pivot. And another one in there. Pivot. Uh, seems like there's resistance there. And so what happened when the news came out? Okay, we got this, and then we went right back to where we were. Le flat aluminum. Now, the very interesting part of this is if it was going to turn bullish again, so let's say you you read the FOMC statement as just prolonged dollar weakness, and it, it was it was po plausible, possible, all that kind of stuff. You could have done it. Um, you would have bought the retracement back into this pivot cluster, right? Because, again, there's a pivot here, and there's a pivot here, and then price action. So if you were a bull, you would have been interested in the, the down and then the up, right? So it's very, very interesting that that didn't happen. Uh, it's also very interesting because it fits my own theory. So I'm going to believe my own nonsense, right? But nonetheless, um, interesting stuff. Lots of pivot clusters here, right? So if you're a, if you were going to sell this, uh, I would look for here and then and probably here. How does that smell? What do you stink? Yeah? How's the trading going, Adam? Good. Glad to hear that. All right. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Now touch me, baby. Can't you see that I am not afraid? All right. Come on, charts. Load it up. Okay, let's take a look at Piggy here. Go out to an hourly chart. Uh, I still have the position open. This is where I sold. I know. I should have tried to get it here, right? <laughs> I know. Look, you can't be a you can't have a game every day. <laughs> I'll, I'll try better next time. Get old. Um, so anyways, a um, couple of things going on. I guess i got to back out even farther here for everyone else to see. All right. You can see we have an old swing here. Right? Old swing. Nice little retracement. And this is actually where we sold this trade originally. Ah, shoot. Are you guys still here? Stupid. Stupid things in the way. Pair 
apparently uh, uh, what you webinar to go, whatever this is. Apparently, it thinks I only have one screen. Really, I have eighteen. Um, so, anyways, uh, this is where we originally sold, and this was I don't know, not quite two weeks ago. And the discussion was a min minimum of 500 pips profit with uh, quite a bit of more potential than that. And the fear issue, uh, as far as it dropping, was this psychological area in here. Not only is it a bottom, but it was a psych level of 115. Sorry, 150. And so I had a lot of concern about that. Can you guys confirm that we still got sound? I clicked a, one of the uh, webinar windows just popped up right in front of me as I was drawing. Okay, good. All right, so that's a sell. In fact, I've got to go even farther out than that uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same train here. There we go. Um, not a complicated trade. Would you agree? Right? We had, we had a, low, a drop, consolidation drop, consolidation, right? And then what you do is you take the old support, it becomes resistance, which we did you know, when we were down here, okay? And the plan was if it does come back, this is where we would want to sell based on a role reversal. It used to be support, now resistance. Very, very easy stuff, I know, price action. And then the goal based on that, right, the 618 predicts a 1382 Fibonacci extension. Oh, my gourd. That was the target. Based on that low and this high. So it's not a random walk. And even with that craziness, bada bing, bada boom, we're still on our way. So that was a short at 155, and, you know, we, we tickled. We got within a shot of, I think it was 950 pips on that one trade. Okay? On the retracement on Wednesday, okay, we had this big spike. Why short? Why short where I, I have the line here? Okay, well, we have an opportunity in here for a roll reversal, and then this is the old area as well, right? You can see it's just, it's just the same plan. So now what you could do is because it's made a low relative to the previous low, you would fib, right, and create a new entry, and it's the same thing, and that's why you'll see it. You take this low to that high, okay, and my crazy, my crazy plan after the the undue volatility, right, was sell at the fifty percent retracement. It's a lot easier when you already have the plan. So before. Or NFP, the, 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 or not NFP, uh, before the FOMC decision, with a couple of days previous when we were at um, tradersway.com doing my, uh, my daily um, strategy session there for, for Tradersway clients, um, what we were talking about is there would probably be weakness, and we discussed the logical reasoning for the dollar weakness. Can anyone share what the thought process was there, why would we assume a reasonable probability or very high probability of dollar weakness? What was the message? What was the message of? Because I want to make sure it's logical, like not some idiot can guess and predict it, right? Right, mispriced, so, uh, sort of. Uh, they, it's a, we had discussed how a lot of institutional investors have a longer-term view of the market. They analyze central banking policy and economic data as it comes out to try to anticipate what the central bank policy is going to be because they face longer-term risk. 
The risk being two different things, right? Well, I guess, I guess, um, well, I guess even just one thing, you know, inflation. Right? Well, but not necessarily employment. That's the central bank. I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about institutional investors. You can call them hedge funds, which are speculative, but most market participants in Forex are not speculative. And so they have a long-term um, you know, overview of their positions in the market, and a lot of it they kind of have to guess. And a lot of traders and, and investors, and this part I don't get, but a lot of them thought that we were getting close to raising interest rates. Now, if you actually did the work and actually read what the FOMC is discussing in their meeting minutes and stuff, I mean, seriously, if you spent a couple of hours, you would have known that there was, you know, that that wasn't going to happen. But anyways, um, you know, billions and trillions of, you know, risk-averse dollars were, were in the market. Basically, the market was long USD. <clears throat> Fine. With the anticipation or assumption, let's say, the better word is assumption, with the assumption that the Federal Reserve Bank of America was going to increase interest rates or, or what I call or what we call normalize sooner than later. And I mean, maybe as soon as April, which is just crazy. But anyways, so that's why the dollar has been strong. Um, it's not all euro weakness. It's there's a lot of dollar strength that was all priced in. So anyways, we're talking about that where. Um, those analysts and those risk-averse, non-speculative market participants were likely to be wrong and were likely to be surprised and would simply need to rebalance their portfolio. Okay? I know that was too long, to, too much to type, right? What Daniel said. So, so yeah, so that's what we had discussed going into it uh, a day or two going into it. And the trade plan was that the trend in central banking policy was not likely over. The trend in economic data was not likely over. But there will be a rebalancing, right? And that our job as speculative investors that are, are dynamic and nimble is to just simply find the new areas to re-enter in the direction of the prevailing trend. That would be a good one, a 50% retracement. Fine. Okay. The, uh, the first trade I took on that was actually EURUSD, right? And I have to apologize because I'm not in the trade because I threw down... Um, I threw down, here it is, 333, right? I threw down a 333 pip limit order and hit it within like two hours. I'm like, oh my God, where's that Euro trade? I didn't realize it was only 333 pips. Isn't that amazing though, on days like that? I mean, when, when you have a trade plan, you know you're going to be right. I mean, that's why you pulled the trigger. You, you did your analysis. And so being right isn't the issue. The issue is getting knocked out in, in a couple of hours. <laughs> and you're like, what? Where's that trade? Where's that trade? Where's my euro dollar trade? Oh, crap. My limit was too close, right? Just So that's the that's the crazy part. But can we learn something from that? The, the part that I'm kind of reading into that is that there was a lot of market participants wait, waiting to get back into the direction of the prevailing trend, just like we had discussed, and it gives me confidence. And, and like I said before, um, it builds confidence in my own nonsense. I mean, I could be completely wrong, but at least I'm confident in my own nonsense. Uh, so even if I'm wrong, I'm still going to do it, which is better than not having a plan at all, right? Right? I'd rather you have a plan, even if you're wrong, I'd rather have you have a plan and the, let's say, dedication or discipline, let's say, to carry out your plan flawlessly, even if you have a completely flawed plan. 
you're going to be way better off. So, uh, so, so that, yeah. So, but the, uh, you know, one last message on this one, it's not a complicated trade, right? The one that I'm in now, but this one wasn't a complicated trade either. The one up here, well, this is 950 pips. And we talked about it very casually. The 618 predicts a 1382. There's the target. This area here is going to be the area of concern because it was a pivot cluster last week, not this week. Last week it was a pivot cluster, but most importantly, the psychological level of 150. Okay. There's one more component I'd like to talk about this uh, as far as the Great British Pound. I love the arrogance of that, huh? Oh, <laughs> the Great British Pound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd call it like the mediocre British pound. Okay. <laughs> Sound is a mediocre pound, right? All right. So we got the great British pound. Um, we were talking about the psychological level of 150, which is obviously a key level psychologically and we were also talking about i m f um and we were also talking about the b o e okay the bank of england run by carney their stance recently was inflation has been down but there has been wage growth and that at most of the falling eye had to do with coming down like a ton of bricks and it just it drops inflation everywhere it's that important even when you pull it out right even core inflation drops because there, other things get affected and and so they're like, look, we're on track. We've been, do we've been pumping money into the system. We've been doing everything a central bank needs to be doing. We've been doing it for several years. Things are improving. Things are getting better. Are they fixed? No. But this incredible drop in I isn't necessarily a sign that the, the programs and policies we've been undertaking as a central bank, it doesn't mean they've been failing. It means that outside influences are, you know, um, are influencing our current measures of inflation. But when you dig a little deeper, the inflation is hiding there, waiting. And so, long story short, Carney says, don't worry about it, eight. Okay? Which is interesting. Hmm. And Carney is conservative. So when he says he ain't worrying about it, he ain't worrying about it. No, that that was actually a Georgia accent, I think. So anyways, um, I thought that was very interesting. Hmm. And we were still above 150. We, in fact, we were talking about that as this was rising. So before the short, we were talking about that. And so therefore, if we double bottomed, which was a potential risk, it might be because maybe we will get some British pound strength. And why not at a psychological level of 150 sounds like a good place, right? So I said the world, however, needs somebody to confirm what Carney is saying. So I had clients go out as a as sort of a process of education to go to the IMF and search for when they release their new economic outlook, in particular for the Great British Pound and the UK economy. Turns out that that's April 16th. So we might have been a little bit early on this because that information hasn't come out yet. So, you know, sometimes you're smarter than the market, right? So in that case, um, well, you know what? We went to 150 and we kept dropping. So now we've hit our target, um, but, you know, we're still, you know, Maybe in a month? What is it, the 20th? Year? So in about a month, the IMF is going to maybe confirm what Carney is saying and 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 perhaps give a good six-month and 12-month outlook for the U.K. economy. 
If we can get that, look for British pound strength. You heard it here today, folks, April 16th. Put it on the calendar. Wait for the report. We'll get the report when it comes out. See how market participants, market participants react. Maybe get a trade in, jam your stop, and leave it run for a bare minimum of, of 1,000 pips. Will you do that for me? I would like the opportunity to give you your first 1,000 pip trade. I'd like it if, if we could, like, you know, we could do like a million turns and everybody agrees that I helped you with, with your first 1,000 pip trade. But you got to do the work, though. I can't pull the trigger for you, right? So, so I've given you a lot of information. I want you to get it. I want you to figure it out. I don't have a link. I'm not going to get you a link. Don't share a link. Go to the International Monetary Fund website and spend, I don't know, four days cruising through the website, downloading reports, getting excited about what you do as a currency trader. And write down, make a list of all the things you don't know that you think you might need to know. What does this mean? What is that? Because these are written by PhDs and MBAs and all these different things, right? Economists are great at making very simple things incredibly complicated. So you're not going to get all of it, but at least now you'll have a, a list of things you can research. Is this going to hurt you as a currency trader, guys? What is the natural rate of employment? Google it. What is wage growth? Google it. Get your brain fat with knowledge. I tell my children every morning, come back with fat brains. And they do. Because my children are the smartest, best looking, kind, kindest most thoughtful children in the world. And I tell them every day. You need to do the same for yourself, right? Get your brain fat on knowledge in Forex. Seek out the information you don't know. So, yeah, spend three or four days just downloading PDFs off the IMF, okay? No, I'm not going to tell you again. <laughs> Well, well, come on. What do I have to do? Put it in your pocket? I, I used to, uh, at FX Boot Camp, I used to say, what am I supposed to do? Land on your front lawn with a helicopter, knock on the front door, kick it down, drag you out of bed, put your hand on the mouse? <laughs> well, then it's my trade. Yeah, that'd be a start. <laughs> There must be a room in the parking lot at the hotel. Yeah, anyways. So, anyway, so I, I want to get you inspired, and I want you to want to do the information. Want you to want me. Okay? So, we can revisit this every week if you want. We can talk about these things. I would like to challenge you to make small changes to your trading or your de definitely small changes to your behavior as a trader is one of my goals in this event. The other goal is I'd like to win FX person of the year at FX street. So if I have to like force a thousand pip trade into your uh, trade history, I'm going to try. But again, I can't do it for you. Right? So um, so you're going to want to want to, you're going to want to want to do it. Okay. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So let's, uh, let's start at the uh, IMF and start downloading some stuff. Okay. <clears throat>
And if you say, well, that's pretty crazy, Wayne, you know what? It's not that crazy, but you'll read about it in the Wall Street Journal, and there'll be a little paragraph. The IMF said blah, 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 blah. But if they give a good thumbs up, if they give a positive look for the IMF, uh, if the IMF gives a positive look for the British pound, I would not be shocked to see a three or four month rally in the British pound. OK. Now, I'll, I'll show you. You know, what's crazy. I've gone to the um, the Bank of Mexico website, searched and browsed through stuff there downloaded a PowerPoint presentation um, that Karstens had done the, the day before. Karstens is the, the, the president of the Central Bank of Mexico. And I read his PowerPoint presentation on, you know, on the sort of the microeconomics of the uh, Mexican economy. And that's pretty crazy in of itself to do that. But even more ridiculous is the whole thing was in Spanish, and I don't speak a word of Spanish. But that's the length I'm willing to go to be successful, to be a master of my universe. And I'd like, I'd like you to come on this trip with me. So Andy says, well, okay, let's talk about this. Andy says... Um, you don't, you know, what stop are you going to have on that, Andy? You enter every trade essentially the same. Now, in some cases, if you're swing trading, you'll, you'll, you're going to need more than a 20 pip stop. But if you're managing the trade directly, like if you're pulling the trigger and watching it for the day, there's no reason why you can't have a 20 pip trade, but or 20 pip stop. But what is different. It's not necessarily the risk part, it's the reward part. And so you can, if you're managing it directly, you can have a 20 pip stop, that's fine. And then eventually you're going to move your stop to break even. And then what? Don't do anything, don't touch it. Say to yourself, my name is Wayne McDonald. I am a bull on the British pound because the IMF has come out and given a detailed report about the health of the UK economy the IMF says thumbs up for the British pound, and I'm long, and I'm going to stay long for the long term or get knocked out of break even. Done. So I'm going to have a 20 pip stop, 1,000 pip limit. Okay? The entry is going to be the same. Okay? Let, let's see what's different. If you're long the British pound, are you going to buy at resistance? Is, is that how you want to play this? No. Do you want to buy when it's overbought? No. What are you going to do if you've turned bullish? You buy at support on a retracement when it's oversold. You long, you drop a stop, ideally, let's say, below the more recent low, which might only be 50 pips. Let it run. Once it's made of a higher high, move your stop to break even. Put your limit at 1,000. You have no risk. Take a walk. So uh, your, your trade entry, whether you're going for 100 pips or 1,000 pips, is exactly the same. So I'm not saying, like, go nuts, have a 500-pip stop. If you have a 500-pip stop, you're just trying to make up for a really lame entry. You just don't know how to trade very well. You're just not that good. So how do you get good? Every, every trade you're going to enter, basically the same. Now, sure, like, if I'm going to trade overnight, because I live in the United States of America, um, I can't be awake all night, every single night, tra trading the euro, right? So what do you do? You do a swing trade. So a swing trade, you could have uh, anywhere between 50 and 150 pips of a stop, depending on the average daily range and the volatility. But let's just say 100 pips stop. But let's say when you, you, when you spot trade, you have a 50 pip stop. 
when you're when you're actively managing it, when you pull the trigger and you're watching the trade, maybe let's say you have a 50 pip stop. Great. Cut your lot size in half. The risk is exactly the same. Okay. That's it. Wake up in the morning. The trade's profitable. Move your stop closer or move it to break even. And don't touch it. Let it run. Let it run. Just let it go. Okay. Uh, Morgan, I already explained it. It's a 50% Fibonacci retracement in the direction of the prevailing trend, which we had already entered. Okay. Plus a little bit of luck, because I'll tell you what happened. This moved like it moved this much in, I'm, I'm not kidding, like one or two minutes. And I actually got a little bit of slippage on that because you know, the normal market doesn't move that fast. That's not trader's ways fault. So I entered at the 50% level and it slipped like 20 pips because it was moving. It moved 75 pips in like a minute. Like crazy, right? So I pulled the trigger, and it took one or two seconds to get in. I mean, it was ridiculous how fast it was moving. So I pulled the trigger here, and I went, uh-uh, and came right back down. And I was up 30 pips within one or two minutes after that. Okay? So my crazy trade plan was to sell at the 50% retracement. Okay? I think it was 151.50 or something. Right. There might have been a daily pivot point in here. I mean, there was a bunch of stuff. I mean, but look, it's a bearish market. I mean, my gosh, what's the what's the complication? Right. Why do we complicate this so much? It's been falling for nine months. What's the problem? You sell high at resistance. Right. What are the other things that complicated fear? No, probably not. You're only fear. You're only fearful because you don't have confidence. Well, why don't you have confidence? Because you have no consistency. Why don't you have any consistency? Because you don't have any control. Why don't you have any control? Because you don't have a trade plan. Why don't you have a trade plan? Because you don't. You're not doing technical and fundamental analysis. And why aren't you doing technical and fundamental analysis? Uh, maybe you don't know how. But most, I find most people, um, they're unwilling or incapable of doing the work. That's it. Most people fail because they're unwilling or incapable of doing the work. And I don't know why that is. All right, that one I can't answer. But, I mean, look, you, you can write, you could, you could probably get a tattoo if you want, and it says sell the British pound, right? And then when the IMF comes out and gives a, a thumbs up, then you're going to have to <laughs> you have to get that lasered off. But your strategy shouldn't change that often, guys. By strategy, I mean like, are you a bull or a bear? Not not your tactical technique. You know, are you a scalper versus a spot versus a swing? But, but like, um, like let's look at this. If you were going to sell a fifty percent retracement, which is just a very very basic concept. With the, with the idea of it making a lower low, okay? This could be a scalp. This could be a spot. This could be a swing, right? What's the difference? The time frame that you're entering, are you on a one-minute chart, 15-minute chart, four-hour chart? How many pips are you expecting? Right? But see, like, I used to have this concept where I'd teach people how to scalp. And I'd say you'll scalp, right, 25 pips minimum, but you'll be upset if you don't make 100. And what most people do is they teach, teach you how to scalp three to maybe you'd be blown away if you can make 10 pips, right? Just blown away. Well, if your trade was any good, you'd be upset that you only got 25. But, you know, whatever. The market does that sometimes. So, like, if you think about it, if you if you sold at support, or if you sold at resistance, right, 
why would it only be worth three pips? I don't, I don't even understand it. People do it. I see. I, I know people that actually do it quite well. Um, but it's, it's a lot of work for very little reward. Okay. So, um, so anyways, I sold here and, you know, it might be worth a lot. We'll, we'll find out. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm just looking for other trades, right? You just keep moving on. Find, find another trade, find another trade, find another trade. Move on. Okay. We can look at USD yen. My entry wasn't so good on this one. Okay. But I'm showing you guys swing trading techniques. Okay. If you're trying to figure out what, what's going on. Um, I have an entry here. Okay. My green zone gives me permission to buy. Okay. So we're in the green zone. Roger that. Fight operation is a go. So I got my green light, but I bought here. Price came down here. <sighs> um, missed a missed a stop by just a hair. Up, and my next one was to buy it here. Missed that one by a hair, and uh, now it's working its way up. The green area are weekly pivot points. So um, we knew, you know, we knew that up here that this was a buy area. It's also the crazy level of 120. Do you think I can anticipate wanting to buy? If I was a bull in this pair, is it easy enough to anticipate that somewhere between 11990 and 12020 might be an opportunity to buy? What do you think, guys? If I had decided up here that I wanted to buy. Is that reasonable, especially when it's right between the, the weekly? Yeah. Crazy at that moment, right? Okay. No, it, it, it lost money for like, um, yeah. So I lost money for less than an hour because you can see it came down and up within that hour. Came down, I lost for an hour, made it back. Now I'm up about 100 pips, right? Bought it at 120. We just hit 121, some change. Right on. So now what? Move your stop to break even, right? If you want to do that. Let's get this a little closer. Yeah. Okay. Done. Can't lose, let it run. Is there any chance whatsoever that this trade could go up without knocking me out first? What are you, what do you think the the chances are, guys? Good, okay, amazing. Well, looks like we stayed above the daily twenty one. I'd say the fifties in control, fifty fives in control. But it seems to me we should be able to make it at least here. Okay, but I think there's a reasonable possibility that. Um, you know, let's say April 1st, which is what, 10 days from now, two trading weeks, or not quite two trading weeks, that we could be where? The monthly conservative target? Monthly conservative target is uh, 121.85. So let's say 122. So our cluster is right in here. Okay. Here's our conservative target. And here's our aggressive target at, yeah, it's about 122. So, you know, I'd say we might be able to get in at 122. Okay. Now, if April comes out, then we might have pivots. 
and that would put us even higher, but it's a start. Okay. What? Right, so what about the seasonality of yen? Well, how many Japanese companies do you think have waited to the very last day to move money? Do you think Honda cuts it that close? Do you think Toyota cuts it that close? Mitsubishi just waited. They're they're forgetful. Hitachi, lazy son of a guns at Hitachi, right? Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Right? It's probably been done. Their their, um, CFO has already done whatever they need to do for taxation and stuff. Um, So, yes, April 1st is um, the new fiscal year in Japan. So if you're going to move money, you're going to need to do it by then, and that would create short-term yen strength. But that might be in there. No. No, I just put that there. So, like, if I get knocked out, I'll get knocked out for, you know, uh, a loss of one pip. Which is fine. And so what I do is just move on to the next trade. Or, look, if I was scared, just take the profit. Take profit. Just take a walk. Okay. So anyways, oh, look at the other thing, Um, the other reason I bought. Can you see I bought right at the monthly pivot point? Cool. What was the bottom of the month? Yeah, it looks like the monthly central. That that gives us a target of R2, yeah. So we should be fine. Okay. Which indicator is this? Which one are you talking about? There's like six or seven indicators on here. Oh, the... Oh, you're probably talking about the, the red zones and the green zones and the, the lines. They're called pivot points. How many people here do not use pivot points? You use daily? Okay, but, okay, you use daily but not weekly and monthly? Okay, if I were me, I would look into that. Okay. All right, so pivot points were created by floor traders because they have to trade in the chaos of the pits. Now, if you're a floor trader, you <clears throat> excuse me, you work for an institution, um, you know, let's say you work for Goldman Sachs or something, right? And so uh, in the morning, let's say maybe uh, an hour before the pits open, you uh, get a list of orders that your clients have placed, right, since the last session. And it says, all right, um, you know, you need to buy this many contracts and you need to sell that many contracts on behalf of our clients. Good. Well, if you just go by gut instinct and emotion alone, these things are going to lie to you and you're going to get caught up in the heat of the moment and maybe end up buying at, you know, at a resistance area or selling at support and, you know, going through some agony. 
or maybe even lose money, right? Which is a big no-no. You're not allowed to lose money, uh, especially when you could throw down two hundred and fifty million dollars with a with a a wave of your hand. They do that all the time when when we listen to the S and P five hundred. Boom, 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 five, right? Boom, 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 five contracts, two hundred fifty million. Boom, it's big money. So, anyways, you got to be careful, right? So what they used to do is create support and resistance by identifying yesterday's high and yesterday's low. Now, if you divided them by two, what would you get? The middle. That's not really what you want. And bears. I mean, no bulls. The bulls would want to buy low. Oh, right. Well, traders do buy low. So, so the bulls, the bear, you don't want the middle. You want it. Okay. How how is the market likely to behave today based on what yesterday is really what you're asking? So the last known piece of information was how did the day end yesterday? So it might have started out bullish yesterday, right? Yesterday might have been bullish. It might have made a really nice higher high, but maybe more information came out throughout the day, like maybe FOMC, right, or something. It came out at 2 in the afternoon. So maybe by 5 o'clock, maybe it wasn't bullish at all anymore. Maybe it was incredibly bearish. So that's new information, right? Because this is an efficient market and prices are based on all known information. So, wow, traders realized, I don't want the high and low divided by 2 because that just gives me the middle. But nobody cares about the middle. We need sort of more extremes, and I need to price in sentiment at the end of yesterday because if they were if they were very bearish at the end of trading yesterday, they might be very bearish today. Even though yesterday started bullish, it ended bearish, and it is probably going to continue bearish today, right? So therefore, you take three prices, the high, the low, and the close, which gives you the sentiment at the end of the day, or if you're a statistician, it gives you a weighted average. And now your moving average, or sorry, now your central pivot point adjusts. It's not the middle. It's got some sentiment built in. Now, you can look at yesterday's trading day, high, low, close, divided by three, or last week's low, last week's high, and where you closed 5 p.m. on Friday, divided by three. You could do last month. You could do last year. You could do last decade, so on and so forth. The high, the low, the close, divided by three. Now, all the other lines are just further calculations based on on the moving average or on the central pivot point. So, for example, I use right. I use M pivots, which are midpoint pivots, which is 50% between the R1 and the R2. That's all. And how do you calculate R1? Well, that's based on what the pivot is, right? Here's M3, which is 50% between the distance of the central pivot point and the R1. So that's why they're midpoints, right? So easy, easy stuff, okay? But this is the projected high if you're a bull, projected high if you were a bull, projected high if you were a bull, projected high if you were a bull. bull. Uh-oh, but something happened, right? So here's the low. Okay, so and those are week uh, weeklies. This, right, monthly. These are monthly pivots here. These big ones. These are monthly pivots. Right. Here's another monthly R one. So what I tend to do is I look for clusters, and by clusters I mean I like to know 
the areas where weeklies and monthlies and dailies all overlap. Okay? So, for example, indicator list, let's just kill moving averages. You you die, GI? All right. Did him out, did him out. Okay, so I got weekly and monthly. Let's see. We uh, I'll leave the I'll leave, leave the oscillator there. So there's clusters. What am I missing? What more could I add to this under the same theme? Without moving averages, who cares? Mac, you forget about it. All right. Um, uh, 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 uh. Come on, come on now, touch me, baby. Can't you see? What am I doing? There we go. That I am not afraid. What was that promise that you made? <laughs> Fibbit, show Fibbos, true, false, price levels, true. Oh, sweet spots, true, true, true. All right, good enough. Um, make them fatties. A little too fat, All right, but it makes my point. I think, hang on. Why can't you tell me? Oh, uh, 0 0.9 on the kitty cat. Retail sales, negative 1.7. Very bad on the kitty cad. Bad news for the cad. USD kitty cad should go up. It's right off of a line. Cool, very interesting stuff. So again, negative 1.7 on retail sales. Um, 0 0.9 on inflation. So not bad, actually, on the inflation. Um, which is good news and not surprising, really, if you know, with retail sales. Uh, but nonetheless, Canadian dollar is weakening. Let's see which mid pivot true, show fibs true. Anyways, let me make it not quite as thick. All right, so one of the things that I'm looking at here is I have now dailies. Okay, I got daily pivots. I also have this area, which is my FIB cluster, the 382, 50%, 618, so that if, let's say, after this move, I'm a bull, which I, I am, right? We all know I'm long, right, here. So it makes a higher high above here, makes a dramatic move to the upsides. So maybe based on this move, you could be bullish here, right? So what what would you do today? Well, the re all these lines, they all add up to something. You come down, these gray lines, which you might have trouble seeing, but they're there, this whole area. There's a gray line here, gray line here, gray line here. Move it over. That's my buy zone for the day based on yesterday's trading range, okay? Okay. Okay. In there, we also have some psychological levels, right? This is 120. This is 121, right? So I like to see these, so I have them indicated. Okay. Nice, right? And then I, I'm looking for this. So you see how I have a pivot point over top of a weekly pivot, a daily pivot over a weekly pivot. 
So I might say to myself, I will do this. What? So that's all it is, is dailies, weeklies, monthlies. It's all the same, only the names will change. The high, low, and close divided by three, just change the point of view, right? Change the observable. Or sorry, change the observer. So feel free to ask questions about such things. You know, some sometimes these small things have a make a big difference. Okay, I don't care what moving averages you use and stuff like that. All of that's nonsense. The most important thing is to make a decision. I don't care what you do to make a decision. So you should know, for example, if you're a bear on this, you should sell it. Why would you not sell it? Okay, are we at resistance? Yeah. Is the oscillator ready to go? Yeah, you bet. Another way to, to sell it is to get a lower low, lower high, lower low. Okay, but you need to be on the clue train, right? Tom says, so your pivot points are not calculated the same conventional way? That is the plain conventional way, Tommy boy. That is high, low, close divided by three. There's no, I don't use anything proprietary because that would mean what? I'm trying to sell you something. Hey, Tom, you can have my pivot points. I have a, I use a special formula. <laughs> RPP, what does that mean, Boyke? Well, there, okay, here's how I describe it, okay? I describe pivot points. So, anyways, here's, here's what you can see I use on a typical chart, right? right? All right. Uh, I describe pivot If you've been trading with me for a while, you'll know that I separate market forces from price action, right? Because you could have a falling market, but prices are still going up. Fine. So I use um, I use a lot of different things to you know to do that. Uh, I use moving averages and I use oscillators. Right. For example, I slow MACD down to represent overbought and oversold conditions in the market. It. I speed stochastics up. or in market price on the chart, so that these moving averages represent whether I'm a bull or a bear, right, and whether I'm aggressive or conservative. And I use the 5 and the 8 to represent over uh, or to represent price action, right? So again, I could line price action with market forces. Going another step, I also like to identify support and resistance in the market, and I use pivot points for that because we're not looking at what – is necessarily is happening in, um, candle by candle. What we're looking at is yesterday's low, yesterday's high, and yesterday's close. And that should give us the general market conditions for our new trading day because today is probably going to be a lot like yesterday, all else being equal, right, unless there's some event, right? Um, and, then, and then we also like to use support and resistance um, based on price, which would be things like trend lines and channels and price action. Okay. The gray lines are Fibonacci. Okay. I use Fibonacci. So, for example, 
um, you, you know, if I if I'm a trend trader, um, let's say down, I'm going to look at the market this way with a fib, right? If I'm a tr trend trader up, I'm going to look at it like like this move, right? And so on and so forth. So what I do with the pivots is it's measuring high, low, and close divided by three. And then I'm like, well, we might as well just calculate the fibs as well. And that's something I've been doing since um, 2005, maybe, 2006, back when brokers didn't offer pivot points. So I had to have pivot points custom calculated, custom made. At that time, it was a custom indicator. And, and I, when we had the pivot points calculated, um, I said, well, I also use Fibonacci, and I like to look at yesterday's trading range. So I'd like you to plot um, pivot points as well. Pivot, or, I mean, fib, uh, fib points, Fibonacci retracements and Fibonacci extensions. And then we would look for overlaps of pivot points and Fibonacci extensions. And I called them fibbits. And that's why this indicator is called a fibbit. Um, it, so it was overlapping pivot points with Fibonacci areas. Now, the interesting thing with that is uh, um, GFT, when I was working with GFT, um, and again, this was 2007 now, 2008, no, way before 2008, yeah, 2006, 2007 maybe. Um, finally, there was so much demand for me teaching pivot points that um, they asked me for our pivot point formula, which we gave to GFT and they built into the DealBook 360. That's actually the FX Bootcamp formula minus the uh, fibbit part. It was just pivot points. Amazing, isn't it? But what's amazing is when I first started trading Forex, you opened up a Forex account with a broker and you didn't get charts. Charts were something new. Yeah, I'm that old. Yeah. Crazy, right? So the whole thing's a new invention. Technical analysis and the use of charts. And, and I've seen the market change over the years, too. The market used to be very gappy. It used to be very jumpy. It used to have lots of, you know, seemingly unpredictable moves. Like you could place a trade and everything's fine, and all of a sudden, bam, you're out 100 pips, and, 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 and nothing happened. Now the market has matured. We have many more market participants, and, and, and the market participants we have are better educated. Things are much calmer, much smoother. I mean, you thought Wednesday was crazy? Pfft, that's nothing. The only crazy thing that's happened to me as a currency trader in the last, I don't know, five years was when the when the pathetic scumbag Swiss lied to us. They should be uh, run out of Europe. We should kick them out. That was bad. That was so unbelievably bad. That went against the last 50 years of modern central banking um, theory to go from central banks around the world trying to provide transparency and clarity, thinking about it, right, the, the, the ECB and the Fed meet with us, on a very regular basis and do take Q&A from the press and give us the information and give us statements and give us their meeting minutes and actually sit down and talk with us. Here's what we're trying to do. Here's what we're looking at. Here's what we're thinking and actually telling people. 
The Swiss on Monday said that their floor was the still the central point of their policy. And less than 24 hours later, or, uh, no, yeah, was it 24 or 36 hours? I don't know. Roughly a day later, they screwed everybody over. That was unbelievable. It it was it cost people their life savings. It drove credible businesses out of business. Um, we're lucky because um, I contacted some of my um, my friends in in other high places, and there are some banks that almost were in some serious trouble, and I don't mean little banks. Stuff that never hit the paper. Stuff you didn't read about. So, like, wow. And all they had to do is to be transparent because it's, I understand, let's say, that they couldn't hold that floor anymore, but we had talked about it for months, like, what, what's their plan on this? Because I don't know how they're going to do it. It's going to be very difficult. You can't buy the euro when the ECB is selling the euro because they're a thousand times bigger than the Swiss, right? So what if the Swiss National Bank can't do that, what are they going to do to, to maintain this price, right? I, I, to me, it was an interesting thing. I was going to learn something because I... I didn't understand how they were going to do it, but they kept saying they were going to do it. Now, if they had talked about it, you know, when the when the ECB was talking about quantitative easing, or when the ECB was actively trying to get gain the powers to do quantitative easing through the court system and stuff. I mean, they had weeks and months they could have prepared the market to say things like, you know what, this le this floor is not n that necessary, right? maybe we're th rethinking our strategy here or that the the central the ECB has changed their strategy and their outlook therefore we're going to need to do something i mean so on and so forth right just something to give the market participants simply to just rebalance their portfolio and maybe you get a day like we had on FOMC where suddenly uh, market participants realize that they're going to have to rebalance, and you get a three or 400 pip move, but not a 3,000 pip move. Well, okay, Boyke says they were speculating on the floor. Wrong. They were told the floor was there. That's different. It wasn't a guess. They were told over and over and over again. So if, if the Swiss National Bank simply said, we're not so sure about this floor anymore, it's, it, it, it doesn't make sense because over the last three years of holding this floor, things have changed. The world has changed. ECB has changed. The Fed's changed. Or, you know, everything, you know, and we are going to need to come up with a different strategy. That's fine. All you had to do was share air that but to on monday to tell the world that it's still the central focus of your policy and 36 later 36 hours later bankrupt businesses that have been around for a long time and i think the polish zloty lost 40 percent or something um is not only negligent in central banking and modern and going against a hundred or fifty to a hundred years of modern banking theory, it, it was almost criminal in my opinion. In, in my humble opinion, almost criminal. It cost people their life savings. It cost very very healthy companies everything. Criminal. But Traders Way clients were just fine, which is good. Thank you, FX Street. Thank you, everyone, for participating for 75 minutes. It's a pretty long, right? Uh, uh, Jen, Jenny, Jenny from the block, uh, just watch the recording. FX Street, post the recording. So peace on earth. Remember that the world needs this. 
a lot. Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. I do this event uh, Mondays through Thursdays at tradersway.com. You need to be a client, but just open up a demo account. It takes less than 30 seconds. I'll be here every Friday at FX Street doing this event as well as trading on farm payrolls live. So I'm here for you every 7.30 New York time, a.m., every morning, 7.30 New York time. 